Good morning, everybody. It's been great. I had one of the most unusual uh, introductions today, and I walked into the exhibition center with my eyes firmly staring at the ground, because, of course, uh, you might get caught. And the first gentleman there caught me, and he said, uh, he said, are you from an institution? And I said, I'm much better now. So I'm looking at the audience out here. I'm sure you're feeling much better now as well. <laughs> the question I want to start with today is why we can't, or why can't we, build secure software? And a better question might be, why aren't we spending all our resources getting better at writing secure code? And the central message of my talk today is that we've been following much the same cybersecurity approach since the start of this century. And yet most of us might agree that the problem continues to grow worse. In fact, much worse, we just heard about the Times Education Supplement, much worse if you measure the impact uh, of 2015 alone. Perhaps we've simply lost our direction or we've been overtaken by the technology or just maybe we're operating on a, a false assumption about the rapidly expanding threats that we face. Once upon a time, and I think back to the dim distant past, which isn't so very long ago, perhaps 80% of hackers were independent freelancers, the script kiddies perhaps, and today the opposite is true. Criminals have access to their very own massive online courses. I found that one over Christmas there, on the top right there you can see, uh, where they can learn how to launch phishing and spamming campaigns as well as how to use these crimeware exploit kits. The one on the right I was playing with over Christmas, you can download it. It's a popular game on Steam. It just gives the teenagers the primers and how you get going on this type of thing. Now, according to a study by the RAND Corporation, a full 80% of hackers are now working with or part of part of an organized crime group. And, to and the tools such as abcheck.ru and scan for You allow hackers to evaluate the possibility of, uh, or to, yes, indeed, evaluate the possibility of detection by 18 of the most popular antivirus programs. And these criminal QA testers can now even sign up to notifications to let them know when some of the prior malware has been uh, detected by some of the antivirus companies. So they know when the security firms know they are writing something. In fact, the QA team is the key to the success of Crime Incorporated. It ensures that encryption shells in which the coder's malware is hidden are good enough to bypass the current security systems, such as antivirus software and, of course, firewalls. Back in 2014, cybercrime represented an estimated uh, $2 billion industry. In 2015, we also saw increasing signs indicating the maturing and the internationalization of the Chinese cybercrime underground, with Chinese-speaking actors operating on most of the international hacker forums. And let's just remind ourselves for a moment that China has a population of over 1.3 billion, some 649 million or so web users, making for a sizable pool of current and future cyber criminals. And as it is, China is one of the world's most prolific and dangerous hacking nations, and not even the friendliest diplomatic agreements seem likely to change any time soon, as both the Norwegian and the Finnish governments uh, discovered, in fact, this year. Let's see if my clicker thing works. Hooray! Yes. You may have seen that on Sky News this week as well. In uh, 2014, five out of the six, uh, I guess five out of six large organizations were targeted with what's called spear phishing attacks specifically targeted attempts to try and steal information. Uh, while digital extortion is on the rise, it's become a profitable business for criminals, and ransomware attacks have doubled, with crypto ransomware exploits growing by some 4,000% in a single 12-month period. And that's just in the UK alone. The Times, again, reported some 810,000 acts of extortion, or 12 times the country average only this last week. And of late, there's been a danger of being lured into the belief that traditional risk-based analysis or security information and event management is the total sum of what we call threat intelligence. And it's this type of discussion that security professionals at all levels need to have 
with the people who drive the business at the top, so their organization. Ultimately, and indeed more regularly uh, in this business, we have to defend our ideas and decisions. We have to defend the calculation model we use to tell our business colleagues why we're making what appear to be alarmist choices and recommendations. Most of us here are old enough to remember the movie Jaws, I'm sure. And if those decisions aren't based on sound principles and an understanding of risk, then there's no hope of being taken seriously. As security professionals, it's our job to understand not only our own limitations or the understanding of risk, but also to responsibly formulate defensible calculations that drive business tactics and strategy in an increasingly dangerous environment. Using probability or simple probability as a definitive metric uh, to judge information risk is not only black magic, but it's most likely to going to give us the wrong answer in an environment of increasingly growing uncertainty. So what are we risking? I love that one, the conference one. Obviously, you spotted that there. You can see it at the back. If you can't see it at the back, it says, please only use Internet Explorer using other browsers causes viruses. Okay. Incidentally, just by the by, I notice that the, I was staying at the Midland Hotel. The Midland Hotel has an official Wi-Fi site. If you stay there, did you notice it's with Midland Hotel, the locked one? And I tweeted earlier on, I'm at Simon Moores on Twitter, so if you want to ask me questions, I'll try and answer them later on. I notice Midland, there is a second Midland Hotel. It's just Midland Hotel, which is open. And I'm just wondering what the second Midland Hotel hotspot is, being naturally paranoid and suspicious. But that's another lecture, okay? So, our electrical grids and our air traffic control systems and our fire and our dispatch systems and even the lifts at work are critically dependent on popular software applications which run on millions and millions of lines of uh, impenetrable code. And airplanes are nothing more than flying Solaris boxes attached to bucketfuls of industrial control systems all powered by millions and millions of lines of code. For example, Microsoft Office 2013 is 45 million lines of code, slightly uh, fewer than the 50 million lines of code required to run the Large Hadron Collider. And even a modern car, should I say, a software platform, as they're becoming now, has about 100 million lines of code. So much of the world's critical infrastructure uses these supervisory control and data systems, SCADA, as I'm sure you've heard of, to, to function. And they automatically monitor and adjust at switching and manufacturing and any other process control activities based on digitized feedback, and of course, data gathered by sensors. And of course, thinking back again in one incident back in 2014, you may remember from the news that hackers commandeered over 100,000 everyday smart objects, including home routers, burglar alarms, webcams, multimedia boxes, and in even refrigerators, and united them to actually create the first ever home appliance botnet. And the attackers used these devices to send more than 750,000 malicious spam and phishing emails. It gets worse. My title, it's not about if you're going to be hacked, as we heard in the introduction, it's about when you're going to be hacked. And asked how he went bankrupt, as you can see on the slide, the great novelist Ernest Hemingway replied two ways, gradually and then suddenly. Okay, and every embarrassed CEO, think of Baroness Harding from Talk Talk, every embarrassed CEO has a press conference the day after their organization gets exploited and blames the attack on advanced persistent threats rather than the teenager attacker, in this case back in Cardiff, who might never be identified, or lone wolf attacks, which IBM actually says was the cause of 55% of attacks back in 2014. <coughs> Alternatively, one might discover among organizations that their company security is overwhelmingly focused on genetic, no, sorry, gen, not genetic, generic, well, maybe genetic, generic malware detection and protection against automatic threats that aren't being guided with any precision. And they collect a substantial amount of information across their IT security infrastructure, but they're actually failing to integrate this with their threat intelligence platform. What's happening is they're not getting a full picture of what their networks or their cloud services are using, the applications running on those services, and the security posture, very importantly, if you think back to uh, big uh, compromises like Target in the United States, 
uh, the security postures of the supply chains and partners which integrate with their own environments. Uh, their IT and their security teams are peripheral concerns. They consider them costs to be managed rather than centers of excellence that support the core business. And very importantly, they're inclined to be reactive rather than proactive in their overall approach to security. If you look on that side, I was in Mexico City a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's called a sompantli, and that was, of course, used to display severed heads of sacrifice uh, for the Aztecs. But increasingly, you look at some of the high-level uh, security uh, um, managers in organizations, uh, they start to fear that their heads might be added to a rack. That's my thought about that. That's where it's going. You're rather like football managers. Next slide. Goody, goody, right. Oh, let's go on here. here. Click. We've got a pause. Right, I'll just move that to the end of the slide. There we go, yeah. Oh, back one. Good. Um, expressions. Expressions, lots and lots of the different ones. Uh, I was surprised at some of the new ones. I was chairing the International E Crime Congress last week. A curious jackal came to mind. And these are all actors. Um, different sources of malware, new exploits, you name them. They're coming up with interesting co-words to describe what's appearing almost on a weekly basis. Uh, and you can see they're coming from different countries like Iran and from Russia and from North Korea and elsewhere. Um, they all represent uh, a clear and present danger to everybody's network, whether it be the stealing of financial information or money or compromise of personal information involving privacy and health and anything you can think of. Symantec reported back... Um, last year some 441 new vulnerabilities and 22 new um, sorry I'll do that one again 22 million new malware variants in October of last year 22 million variants that's almost good news because in June there were 57 million new variants so in October it was slightly less than, than June but still we're running in the tens of millions on a monthly basis in all these things which are starting to come out and they all mean something really very nasty. And because of the billions of dollars of organized crime and state-sponsored funding slushing around, um, threat uh, sophistication will continue to evolve faster, understandably, than our attempts to be able to remediate it. And we're witnessing the arrival of just-in-time products and services that can often self-assemble, like the examples there, uh, on demand. Another thing is that affiliate networks um, are now starting to form the very backbone of the cyber criminal enterprise. And many of these uh, we're discovering now, or we've known for some time, are located in Russia. And these so-called partnerkers work day and night to drive as much traffic as possible to the websites of their criminal partners. Global uh, crime syndicates, such as one called Innovative Marketing in Kiev, have earned upwards of half a billion dollars, tax-free of course, in just three years. Gives you room for thought. Okay. So, without any doubt, um, I'm sure everybody here would agree, we need to begin to implement new solutions to protect all our networks equally from the risk of attack, while recognizing that each one may have specific requirements and weaknesses or priorities, whether that's in education, whether that's in business, whether that's in government, each one may be subtly different. The size of the attack surface, you can see my points there, can only expand. And with billions of new devices and millions of users connecting to the Internet of Things, uh, the latest smart thing we're talking about, including smart meters, uh, heating and air conditioning systems, and many more personal devices connecting all the time, the ability to gain visibility into the potential attack vectors, let alone close them out to the sort of people we're talking about, becomes increasingly challenging, if not impossible. So let me summarize the slide you can see here. Um, and on the, the right-hand side, you might be able to see an illustration showing a new malware created simply last year. We can see that threat diversity will increase due to the growing variety of objects and adversaries can now target. Uh, many of which sit in insecure and often very, very cloudy locations. Attackers are able to devise uh, new methods and blend sophisticated to techniques and encrypted infiltration to accomplish their mission. Just as companies have rapidly adopted uh, cloud computing to store their files on services such as Google Drive and Amazon, so has organized crime. 
For example, uh, the, the hackers who broke into the Sony PlayStation network uh, used the vast computing power of Amazon's uh, cloud computing services to break uh, several of Sony's encryption keys, providing access to hundreds of thousands of user accounts and credit card details. Second point there is that the compliance and the regulatory burden can only have a single upward direction of travel, and we're seeing that with European legislation, which will appear very, very shortly. Visibility across the network itself is going to become paramount, because without automation and much, much faster analytics, we poor humans alone won't be able to scale with the environment we're actually trying to protect. And of course, threat awareness will become the focus as we seek to identify threats based on an understanding of, of both normal and abnormal behavior. Um, so we can identify indicators of compromise and make decisions, and of course, try and respond rapidly to what we see flowing over the network. And if we concern ourselves with things and SCADA connected devices, then both Russia and indeed China and maybe somebody else have allegedly uh, mapped America's power grid, probably our own, so that in times of crisis or war, um, its entire net electrical network could be shut down or turned off. And if you may have seen that before from news a couple of weeks ago, the screenshot is from a search engine called Shodan. There are several like it. Um, that's revealed an unsecured X-ray machine here in Sao Paulo. Okay, so on Sh Shodan is great for actually looking for devices connected via the internet, all these new things that are appearing and looking for the IP address. So it just illustrates somewhere in the world you can go to Shodan and you can look things up. And if you're a hacker, well, maybe you can play around for a while, but it worries you if it's inside a hospital. And here's the uh, information is beautiful chart up to October of last year. And to paraphrase that movie Jaws, we need a bigger chart. Okay. The recent Ofcom news a couple of weeks ago, a data loss, illustrates that even with a strong network perimeter in place, it's just not enough to deter the insider. Perimeter security is similar to a fence around a house. However, what happens if someone inside the house is the thief? And today it's, the, uh, it's, the imperative, well, it's become an imperative that organizations adopt a far more data-centric uh, security approach that defends the data itself, and of course, typically, and it's a controversial subject now with the IP bill, typically by encryption or by tokenization. And the chart begs at least eight questions that might have been asked of each and every chief information security officer in those companies before they, uh, the, the compromises took place. What are the assets you're trying to protect? What are they worth to the enterprise? What's the impact to you if they're disabled, lost, or stolen? What's your specific security objective? What's your threshold of information risk? What's the minimum level security strategy that can withstand the robust security from investors and governors and regulators and insurers and, and your customers? How large is the impact surface of your organization? And what's the minimum level of cost investment required to mitigate the highest probability of those risks actually occurring? And how do you measure your critical success factors? And like that talk talk example, how do you prove, maybe to Channel 4 News, that you've taken all reasonable steps to actually protect your information security assets? <clears throat> there are two large forces that are pressuring us to rethink the approach to network security now. Uh, the use of public uh, cloud applications and, of course, uh, the expanding mobile workforce, and I can see an array of phones and tablets and devices out here today. Organizations now have an increasingly large number of assets that are no longer bound to a specific enterprise location or place. And this is a so-called dissolving perimeter challenge, and it's leading to the flexible adoption of cloud services driven by organizations or all organizations' desire to reduce costs, to uh, increase adaptability, and quickly meet future business requirements. And the result is that companies no longer truly own the end-to-end -end business operations of their IT organization. Their assets are increasingly belong to and under the control, perhaps, of somebody else. 
It's a third party. And this can mean that an organization's data may be processed and held externally and used on non-corporate or organizational devices, all of which is outside of any direct control. Now, I mentioned back in 2014, over 300 million new pieces of malware were created. That's just a million a day, almost, which is challenging the resources of traditional antivirus-type vendors to tackle the problems. Um, Last year alone, 28% of all the malware that was created was virtual machine aware as well. In fact, last year saw the greatest number of cyber attacks recorded around the world. A total of 304 million samples, as I mentioned, which means that, that uh, more than a quarter of all malware samples ever recorded were actually produced in 2015. About 27.63% is, I think, the exact figure. Modern crime then has become reduced and distilled to a software program that anybody can run at tremendous profit, like those chaps over in Kiev I mentioned. And as you can see from the slide, keeping any organization's uh, risks and exposure beyond reasonable limits demands a new periodic table of security where many of the components themselves frequently uh, interact in a business-critical fashion. Staying on top of any part of this has become a daily struggle uh, for organizations confronted, of course, with this growing threat of information risk and increasingly want to do with privacy. Um, that the fear, for example, of uh, things like crypto locker, ransomware, is becoming pervasive now and it's going to become even more of a problem uh, over the next 12 months. Mobile devices have smaller interfaces that offer less security information and have fewer computational network resources actually for defense. Proxy servers rented out by cloud services uh, allow criminals to significantly scale up their operations and, by, uh, and bypass um, reputation-based uh, detection systems. They also allowed attackers to assume multiple fake identities by simulating a presence in different geographical locations depending on where those servers themselves might be located. Today, using just uh, distributed computing power that you can get from the cloud and tools such as CloudCracker, you can try 300 million variations of your potential password in about 20 minutes at a cost of about $2. Just another tool which is available to the bad guys. So let's move the subject on just a bit more and change the theme. Um, I'm sure you'll recognize what that is. It's 80 years, I think, since the, the Spitfire arrived. We need to rethink this thing called the endpoint. Um, simply a rules and signature approach to dealing with a problem, I'm sure everybody in here would agree, as well as the vendors out there, is simply not enough. And when you think of the Battle of Britain, you think of the Supermarine Spitfire, but the less elegant fighter, the Hawker Hurricane, actually downed more aircraft during the Battle of Britain. Mm, right. That's Calais a few, a few years ago. I, I was flying a chase plane. Um, that, you see that model Spitfire there? It's a kind of a huge scale model Spitfire to chase plane it back across Calais, across the channel for this celebratory thing. The chase plane was faster than my aircraft in the background there. But uh, just coming to the point, the speed of the Spitfire there, and the point there is performance matters. If we think back in history, uh, Eric Locke was the chap who became the RAF's most successful Allied pilot during the Battle of Britain, shooting down some 21 German aircraft and sharing in the destruction of one. And you remember, if you're history buff, Alan, um, Adolf Galland uh, shot down 35 from the German side. The Luftwaffe only had slightly more of the faster single-seat uh, single fighters ready to take on the RAF uh, compared to the RAF 750 um, uh, Spitfires. And of course, as you know from the history of the Battle of Britain, German losses were much heavier because of the bombers. Uh, more than 2,500 aircrew were killed, compared to 544, I can see here, for the RAF. And the point I'm trying to make here is that the Spitfire uh, had a slightly higher top speed than the Messerschmitt 109 on the right there, and a slightly tur a faster turning circle. Uh, the German plane may be able to, to climb and dive faster. Now, if it were me back in the Battle of Britain or you asked me which aircraft I would choose, I do love the Spitfire, but if I had to go and fight an aircraft as a pilot, I would actually fly the ME-109. Uh, it had a much bigger gun, more ammunition, 
straight line speed was much, much better. And the reason I'm, I'm just drawing that as an example is to do with the myths surrounding security. We believe things, it could be to do with software, it could be to do with antivirus, which have become almost a part of the mythology in trying to deal with the problem we face today. And we need to readapt our thinking to think, well, maybe the model we're using is not the model which is entirely appropriate to 2015. It might have worked back in 2001, but maybe it doesn't work so well today. So it would be nice if all our security experts could keep up all the bad guys out. Uh, but it's clear that applying all the secure coding and the patching and the passwords and spam filters in the world will never result in sufficient security. That's actually a real screenshot from Quora. It's very clever, that. Yes, I thought. Okay. Criminals are finding new ways of, of breaching these, uh, the endpoint, wherever they may actually exist physically or virtually, as more applications migrate to the cloud or they find their way, as I mentioned in the previous slide, onto mobile devices. And of course, we're seeing these below the operating system, the BIOS attacks. They're growing as fast as attackers seek new vulnerabilities in the firmware, the hardware and the operating systems, and they need to be strengthened against much more conventional attacks too. So risk and impact will continue to actually escalate. Cybersecurity systems that rely exclusively on points uh, in time defenses and techniques simply can't keep up with the unfolding attacks and we need to have active defenses on the boundaries of our networks. However, boundary defense is not alone and it's not sufficient and we need to have a truly robust uh, security system and the defensive tools uh, needed to focus on protecting that perimeter as well as the data flying inside the network. And forgive me if I'm getting too technical, so I'll, I'll try and move back just a bit. Emphasis, which is really the message of my slide here, emphasis has now moved away from prevention and protection to detection and response. Behavior analytics technology is evolving rapidly to identify irregular actions and deliver a single view of any security position that could actually indicate uh, compromised accounts and systems. But it, we're still seeing that uh, companies and organizations are still spending some three quarters of their security budgets on the old traditional prevent and protect approach. So three quarters of companies, the message from my earlier slides, the Battle of Britain, are still locked in to that old model of let's throw a spitfire at the problem. Whereas we actually move, move forward a bit, we're in 2016 now, and the model itself arguably doesn't work to the same degree of um, flexibility and integrity anymore. Okay. Threat modeling. I did like that film. The novelist Ray Bradbury was once asked, are you trying to predict the future? And he replied, hell no, I'm trying to prevent it. <laughs> the way we understand the model that we use to predict threats is changing, and both cy the cybersecurity industry and business alike have come to realize that, as I said in that last slide, that early detection after a breach, followed by rapid containment and sensible mitigation efforts, in a careful step-by-step -step fashion are absolutely essential to avoid a compromise to becoming an absolute catastrophe. And when I think of catastrophe again, I think of talk talk. What was it, 34 million provision in the accounts? Uh, loss of 100,000 users, can it, can it get much worse than that? And that was the example we saw on our TV screens of actually how not to deal with a big problem. Remember the example of the, the chief executive standing up and said, we did everything that was expected with us, uh, from us, we followed the rules. And that didn't quite work with the customers, okay? That didn't inspire confidence. Um, and subsequent to that, we've, obviously the news discovered that some of the, the, um, the efforts hadn't been secure enough. I, I won't go any further into that. I wrote something in The Observer about that one. You can't expect organizations to buy three or four or five or six or 12 different products, each with its own dashboard and figure out a way to manage all those on, in a business, an institution or an enterprise. Instead, organizations should be looking to integrate as many products as possible and assess the potential or the unforeseen gaps, which can frequently be very tiny indeed. 
And it's all about integration and automation to accommodate security at speed and scale. Which brings us to the Reverend Dr. Bayes. I'm sure people in here recognize the Reverend Dr. Bayes, yes? Good. Um, and there's one thing in the uh, uh, basing and thinking alike. There's something, anybody ever heard of the Carter catastrophe? Carter catastrophe? If you like, be. All right, just very briefly. The, the Carter catastrophe was from a physicist called Brandon Carter, and using Bayesian mathematics, and still difficult to disprove, he says, Why are we, or you and I, living today? In other words, what is the chance of you, in the entire length of human history, being on your own, being one of the first 600 people that walked out of Africa, or being one of everybody who ever existed? Okay? Well, the possibility is you're more likely to be one of everybody who ever existed. It's like winning the lottery. And so his, Brandon's um, um, proposition was that we're, very clo we're closer to the end of time than the beginning of time or the end of the human civilization because in terms of Bayesian mathematics, uh, we should be here rather than over there. That's why we live today. But I won't go into that. That's a totally different lecture. But uh, interesting one nonetheless. But Bayesian mathematics comes into an awful lot of things at the moment. And if I move on to the next slide, uh, if you've got any chess um, buffs here, um, checkmate in how many moves. I'll give you a few seconds while I'm talking about it. And what I'm trying to present here is... I'm going to screen up a second. Where's the thing going? Yeah. How does a chess grandmaster determine the answer under two seconds? And he does it by pattern recognition. I like to play chess badly. Um, I was very lucky about 15 or so years ago when I managed to have dinner with Gary Kasparov uh, in London uh, not long after he was beaten by Deep Blue and he was still very, very unhappy about it. Um, but if you think how we've moved on between Deep Blue back in 1997 and what happened over the last week, go. Does anybody follow that with Deep Mind? And this brings me to my next proposition. Hopefully... We'll move on. Will we move on? Right. We lost a slide. Move back one. Oh, there we are. So, oh, back one again. There we go. Uh, you'll probably recognize Dennis Hassabis from DeepMind. Uh, bought by Google for 300 million pounds uh, last year. Um, very successful, of course. And, of course, London is becoming the incubator for artificial intelligence on, on a global basis. And I want to talk very briefly in the last few minutes about the arrival of the so-called uh, algorithm economy and, and cloud-based artificial intelligence, um, which I see as the, fut the, the inevitable future of this industry. And that's combining artificial intelligence and machine learning analytics and, um, to help organizations identify never-before seen network-borne cyber threats in almost real time. And when the computer scientist John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence in 1956, the year I was born, he defined it succinctly as the science and engineering of making intelligence machines. 70% of United States stock trades are driven by algorithms, and vast networks of high-frequency trading machines can collectively make trillions of calculations per second and trades that can be executed in less than half a millionth of a second, of course, many, many times faster than the blink of an eye. The malicious use of AI and computer algorithms has now given rise to the crime bot, and that's an intelligent agent scripted to perpetuate criminal activities at a scale, and that can only itself become worse. Um, as an example, one US federal agency was getting hit with more than a billion incidents in a single day. And prior to automating its security operations, the agency was only able to handle approximately 85 of those uh, in a single day through manual processes. Additionally, an, um, manual reviewing each incident uh, took between 11 minutes and 11 hours. And of course, Google, as I mentioned, acquired DeepMind in 2015. And uh, what we're seeing now is increasing the open sourcing of artificial intelligence through obviously the likes of DeepMind and IBM Watson and more. And that's not only going to have an opportunity for business, but it's also going to have the opportunities for organized crime. Think of apps, the open sourcing of apps. Think of the open sourcing of organized crime. Sorry, the open sourcing of artificial intelligence 
and then you can see the potential downstream risks that will come with it. So, I'm told I have five minutes to go, so where did that come from? That shouldn't be there. We seem to have moved back a bit, haven't we? We seem to have moved back from the beginning on the slide thing, so we should have video number one. There we are. Space Invaders should run. This was... Uh, the point I'm making is that you recall DeepMind, what they were doing first of all, is they trained the machine on Atari games. And the first thing they trained it with is uh, Space Invaders. No specific objective. Try and gather the most points, don't get killed. Okay? And they allowed the machine to learn, the old Atari games. And after a while, the machine, after one, 200, 300 attempts, the machine started to learn very quickly indeed and started to completely destroy the Space Invaders game. And if you're my age, you may have spent years playing Space Invaders. I remember at the University Student Union in London, you know, playing Space Invaders with a 10p piece. It was addictive. And the machine became very, very good at Space Invaders. The next one they tried, just moving on, you can see it'll kill all the Space Invaders. Let's see if the next one works. Right, remember this one too? <laughs> Atari Breakout. The interesting thing about Atari Breakout, if it runs, does it run? Is it running? Yeah. Right. Is the machine's algorithm also started to learn, but it learned after a while, if we have time just to go through this, because I can see the clock ticking over there, that after a while, DeepMind, the baby DeepMind, you may have seen this on, on YouTube, suddenly find it, found a whole new strategy for actually winning a breakout. It seems to be moving there. Basically what it does, you'll see if maybe you can move on just a bit, come on, after 100, 600 training episodes. Yeah, here we go. After a while, the agent discovered that nobody else had discovered, in, in, as far as I know, in human beings, that the best way to win at this game was to actually tunnel behind the wall. You know, anybody seen that before? Yes. Okay? And it starts to make you think. And the same sort of thinking occurred clearly with go in Korea um, in the last week or so. The machine started to think and it started to win and that was a huge step forward in human history. It started to be very clever. So, the last couple of slides. I can see two minutes going out. I'll run through at speed. Next slide. Can you advance me to the next slide? Just in case. There we go. Right. So, being human, we're fallible. We naturally overestimate uh, what we know and underestimate uncertainty by attempting to reduce the space of the unknown. Um, drawing a conclusion from my earlier slides, everyone here might have a slightly different protection goal. But in every case, a clear strategy is required, one you can articulate to your chief executive in an argument that he or she can grasp. And you need to balance your own security controls against the heavy costs of implementation across that increasingly widening surface of your own organization. The chief executive may want confidence, but more importantly, perhaps he or she may want to be able to point at the investment and the security controls as being pragmatic and reasonable and judicious in the event, the likely event, of a security breach, whether that be sophisticated or otherwise. And in the story here, I was doing a, a, lecture in London, a lecture in London a couple of weeks ago, a, a kind of CIO masterclass, and it was great um, because they had a, a coffee machine. You can see that there. And I, I've never seen an, um, an iPad-connected coffee machine before, but it was internet-connected. Remember the Internet of Things? And we were all there thinking, how can we hack into the coffee machine? Yeah? Because has the coffee machine got a window into the network of the organization? Remember what I was saying about refrigerators? Potentially, yes. And so, coming up to my last slide, everybody panics and they tell me to get off. Oh, can I have the last slide? Because I've gone back to the beginning again. The suspense is killing me. Here we are. Don't know why it's going back to the beginning on the system. Can I have it back? No. No. One more. Well, my last slide has disappeared. It doesn't matter. I'll tell you what the last slide says. You can imagine it, okay? Um, the last slide says, if you don't control the enemy, the enemy will control you. I mean, that's a quote from... Hooray! From Musashi in Japan. 
But I'll also leave you with a quote from George Orwell. And he said, sometimes the first duty of intelligent men is a restatement of the obvious. And perhaps the obvious is something that we as an industry might have been ignoring for rather too long. So think of the obvious, think of the future, think of artificial intelligence, and think of the risks which are downstream, because it's becoming an inevitability. How are we going to manage that risk? I won't bore you anymore. Thank you very much. Simon, uh, Simon, thank you very much indeed. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm petrified. Um, we're, we're just going to swap over um, uh, Max. So while we're doing that, we've got uh, time for a few questions for Simon. Um, who wants to go first? Or are you all as petrified as I am? Right, we've got a question over here, Mike. There we go. Mike Roach from uh, Watt University. Um, as Adrian says, um, the, um, the thought that comes to me is that our resistance is, is probably futile. Um, do you see, are you aware of a likely engagement by uh, governments with pushing back against the, as it were, the dark side here? Um, as individual managers of individual networks or, or little corners of the internet. I'm not sure that we right. collectively are going to fix this. It, it's a very good question, sir. And I was at an event on cyber warfare and stuff at uh, Westminster last month. And um, Baroness Pauline Neville Jones turned up, you may know her. She's a very forthright lady. Um, we were having a, a forthright discussion about cyber war and um, the Chinese threat and such like. But I also said at the time, and I've said the same in The Guardian, that I think that we need a minister, a minister, a single minister, who is responsible for the risk, for cybercrime, for cyber, all this stuff that goes with it, like the United States. And the government response is that we have distributed responsibility. Obviously GCHQ, Cabinet Office, Francis Maud, and Home Office, and it's spread. And my view is... It's not working because the only government minister we have responsible for internet security, I think, is Baroness Joanna Jones. She has a wonderful, uh, well, she does a wonderful job in regard to the threat against children. So she is the cyber security czar, but it's focused in one direction. Whereas we can see elsewhere that the focus is a real threat against colleges, universities, business, and it's getting worse. And until government grasps that, I think we can't see an improvement in the problem that we're going to be facing downstream. Okay, time for one more question. Over. I don't know whether or not you saw the um, previous presentation where we saw uh, Minecraft being used as a front end into all sorts of corporate systems. Do you see any way of allowing us to be that agile and that dynamic and yet still having um, adequate controls against the security threats? I think, as I understand your question, I think that the, the answer is going to be that, that that type of Minecraft, you know, artificial intelligence type of thing is becoming inevitable. You're seeing companies like the Symantec's of this world, the Hewlett Packard's of this world, many, many more, moving towards cloud-based delivery of security services and much more intelligence through their SOCs and, of course, through the, the products and programs that they are delivering. And my view, again, is that we cannot manage this problem individually or in isolation, and that increased machine intelligence and response is the only way that we are going to find to actually try and deal with the increasing number of threats. And we saw, what, 300 million last year? How can we as human beings deal with, you know, 300 million threats and they're changing, they're becoming polymorphic, they're becoming intelligent. And what are we going to do when the bad guys start to use those same artificial intelligence toolkits which are so generously placed on the market for the benefit of humankind and they start developing like apps or Android apps? That's going to be a big problem. Thank you. Right, Simon, thank you very much again.